screen objects in the universe by Coles and Human Resources. Thanks for responding. Thanks, Steve, and thanks all of you for coming here. Uh, so yeah, what I would like to talk about today is the kind of physics and astronomy that we can do by studying extremely compact objects such as black holes and neutron stars. This is, for example, one type of event involving black hole neutron stars that we hope to observe. Uh, one of the most extreme events involving black holes and neutron stars is the numerical simulations of a neutron star being ripped apart and partially swallowed by a black hole. And I'm going to get to the type of event towards the end of the talk. But first, let's look at what black holes and neutron stars are and how we form them. Maybe the most defining characteristic of a neutron star is how ridiculously compact an object it is. A neutron star is an object which is somewhere between one and two times the mass of the Sun, maybe up to three times the mass of the Sun. Yet the radius of a neutron star is only five to ten miles. That means that if you had a neutron star centered here on campus, the surface of the star would barely reach San Francisco. And that's an object which has the same mass as the Sun, or more. So it is ridiculously dense within the neutron star. It has the same density as within the nucleus of an atom. But the nucleus of an atom has only a few to a few hundred protons and neutrons, while a neutron star has an entire sun worth of mostly neutrons. This gives you an object which has really extreme properties and allows you to test the laws of physics in an environment that we cannot hope to match in laboratories on Earth. Of course, the disadvantage is that your laboratory, no, your laboratory no is all the way across the galaxy in space, which makes it a lot harder to study it. Black holes take it a step further. They are so dense that there is a region around them from which no information, no matter, no light can escape. This is the event horizon of the black hole, and we cannot hope to see what is inside it because no information gets out. Mathematically, we represent black hole as all the mass at one point somewhere in the middle of the event horizon, but we cannot hope to actually look at what is in there. All we can see is the event horizon, which, is, which has a size of about one to two miles per solar mass of material inside the horizon. And there's a pretty wide range of black holes available in the universe. Black holes go from a few times the mass of the sun to 10 billion times the mass of the sun in the, at the center of some very massive galaxies. So it gives us a wide range of uh, systems to study. And both black holes and neutron stars are very interesting because they are the objects around which the effects of gravity are going to be the strongest and the weirdest. Uh, it allows us to actually test uh, or the, or the laws of gravity, and in particular Einstein's theory of general relativity, in a setup that we cannot hope to attain in the solar system or on Earth. And beyond gravity and nuclear physics, black holes and neutron stars are also interesting as sources of very energetic events that we observe regularly in the universe in pretty much all bands of light, uh, from gamma rays to radios. And they are also sources of an elusive type of uh, wave, so-called gravitational waves, which are a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity that I will uh, discuss towards the end of the talk. So how do you form these very compact objects? Well, most uh, black holes and uh, certainly all neutron stars are uh, formed as the result of the end of the life of a massive star. If you have a star, it is normally supported against collapsing under its own weight by nuclear fusion at the center of the star. The nuclear fusion in the star produces energy which supports the star against its own gravity. But that can only last for so long because you are going to burn all your, the, the hydrogen in your star into helium, then maybe you can burn that helium into carbon, and you can keep burning and burning up to the point where you reach iron, and iron cannot undergo nuclear fusion. It's, just, it's, just, it's stable to nuclear fusion. That means that once you reach that point, there is no way in which you can still support your star using the energy from nuclear fusion. You have to find something else. And we observe in practice that there are basically three possible outcomes uh, to the end of the life of a star. The first is that at some point, maybe, maybe before reaching iron, maybe when you have a core made of helium or carbon, the core stops collapsing and you end up with an object which is maybe a thousand miles wide, formed of whatever the core was made of, helium, carbon, whatever. That's a wide dwarf. For more massive stars, for the most massive stars, you see total collapse of the core to, uh, all the way to a black hole. And in between those two regimes, there is a regime in which the, the iron core that you form at the end of the life of the star 
collapses to an object about 10 miles wide, a neutron star, and as the material falls onto that forming neutron star and is brutally stopped on the surface, there is a strong rebound of the material in a, sh in a very energetic shock away from the neutron star, and that's a supernova, at least one type of supernova. Another type that Ken Shen is going to discuss next month. Uh, this is a core collapse supernova. Um, and so you, you have those three possible outcomes. Either you're from a wide dwarf, which is about 1,000 miles wide, you're from a neutron star, which is about 10 miles, or you go all the way to a black hole. What determines which one it is? Well, to understand that, we actually have to go into quantum mechanics. Without talking about quantum mechanics, we cannot explain what can possibly support the star against gravitational collapse. And we have to remember a few key things about quantum mechanics uh, when thinking about the collapse of stars. The first is that particles in quantum mechanics are only allowed to live in discrete quantum states with their own energy. There are only some, some states that are allowed, and they cannot be in any other configuration. The second is that Pauli's exclusion principle tells us that for particles such as protons, electrons, and neutrons, which form normal atomic matter in the stars, uh, two particles cannot be in the exact same state. Now, when densities are relatively low, when the star is pretty spread out, that doesn't really matter. Particles are far apart and they can be each in their own state without, uh, without anything to worry about. When you pack them very closely together, you know, they start to compete for the few low energy state available, and you have to start packing them into higher and higher energy levels. And the first, uh, so higher and higher energy levels mean that the particles have higher velocities and just provide pressure support to the gas. And the first particle, which gives you a significant amount of pressure, uh, which is given significant energy through that quantum uh, effect, is the electron. Uh, and as that, that's uh, effectively what happens when you form a white dwarf. You, comp you bring all the matter close together in, in such a dense state that quantum degeneracy of the electrons can provide you pressure that stops the star from collapsing under its own weight. So it is the fact that you pack the electrons so close together they are competing from the few, energy, the few low energy states available and have to be packed in higher and higher energy states that, makes, uh, that gives you the pressure sufficient to stop the collapse. And you can also see that, that effect in, uh, if you look at the dependence in the radius of the wide dwarf with its mass, which is shown here, the mass on the x-axis and the radius on the y-axis. And you can see that as the mass increases, the radius of the wide dwarf decreases. And that's because the more mass you have, the more pressure you need to support your, your wide dwarf against collapse. And so the more you have to pack the electrons so that they occupy higher and higher energy levels. There's a limit to that, though, and we can theoretically compute it and see that as you go to a wide dwarf of about 1.4 solar mass, the radius that you need to support that mass goes to zero. So you cannot possibly have a wide dwarf which is more massive than this and be stable. And so that's what determines whether a star can stay as a wide dwarf or whether it actually has to collapse to something denser than that. that if your core reaches a mass la larger than 1.4 solar mass, it, has, it cannot stay as a wide dwarf. It has to collapse further. So that's why the low mass stars can give you wide dwarf, but the high mass stars cannot. What happens then? Well, one thing that can happen is for the formation of a neutron star. And how does that happen? Well, as, as you keep collapsing your core, the electrons are in higher and higher energy levels. And at some point, they are so high energy that an electron has more energy than the difference in mass between a proton and a neutron. What does that mean? Well, normally, in, no, uh, in low density material, if you have a neutron running around, because it's more massive than a proton and an electron together, and nature naturally tends to send states into uh, low energy uh, configurations, the neutron is going to disintegrate into a proton and an electron. But if your electrons know us, have such high energy that an electron plus a proton has more energy than a neutron, and that's what happens when you get to very high density, your electrons and protons are going to annihilate and form a neutron. And that's why as the density becomes larger, you can, you, you, all your electrons and protons are going to disappear into neutrons and you form something that is mostly neutrons, which is a neutron star. And what stops the collapse of the neutron star is the same effect as for the, uh, the white dwarf, but no, with the pressure being supported by the neutrons being packed very close together. 
Again, you, you have neutrons occupying higher and higher energy state and, be, and providing you with pressure support, and that can uh, support your neutron star. Now, we understand why dwarfs pretty well and what they really should be. Uh, the interactions between so many neutrons packed together is something that we don't really understand that well. Uh, it's, it's an environment that we cannot really study in the laboratory, and there are large uncertainties in what a neutron star should actually look like. Uh, here is one theoretical model, again showing the mass of a neutron star on the y-axis as, as, uh, as a function of its radius. You can see that as th there is a fairly wide range of radii which, has, which are allowed by the theory and which, are, which remain largely unconstrained at this point. So by measuring the size of a neutron star, you can actually start constraining the interaction between multiple neutrons. So if you, if you, you can, by studying a neutron star half a galaxy across or in another galaxy, you can actually get constraints on nuclear physics if you can pinpoint the radius of the star or, for that matter, if you can tell how big of a star you can, you can form. In the same way that a white dwarf cannot go above about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, there is a maximum mass below which neutrons cannot support the star against collapse, and that maximum mass is currently unknown. It is somewhere between two and three solar mass, but actually figuring out exactly what it is will give you information about how neutrons interact together. So that's one of the reasons we are interested in studying neutron stars, is that by themselves, uh, just measuring the properties of neutron stars can allow you to constrain nuclear physics. Let's move to black holes. Well, one way to form black holes is if you have an object which is too massive to remain a neutron star. Again, we don't know exactly how much mass that is, but if you reach a neutron star which is above the maximum, the maximum allowed mass uh, for neutrons to provide enough pressure to support you from collapse, you are going to collapse all the way to a black hole. That's how you form relatively low mass black holes from, from stars that are a little bit too high to form a neutron star. Black holes which are maybe five to ten times the mass of the sun or a little bit more. We also see another type of black holes. We see black holes at the center of galaxies, which are between 10,000 and 10 billion times the mass of the sun. Those are very different objects. I mean, they, they are mathematically they're the same thing, but they, the way we observe them is actually fairly different. Uh, one way in which we, we, we can see them is if they accrete a lot of gas, if a lot of the gas falls into the black hole, uh, it, uh, a, a lot of energy is emitted in high, um, high velocity um, outflows from, the, from that very massive black hole that we see as jets which can be larger than the size of a galaxy. That's one way. We can also hope to see the actual disk of, materi of material around the black hole, which is something that uh, is soon going to be possible for the black hole at the center of our galaxy, as I'll show later in the talk. And that's because of general relativistic effects that we are going to look at in a minute. Uh, gives you a picture of a hot region, which is sort of a crescent around the black hole, and then the black hole is, of course, the region where nothing is coming out of, uh, on the right of that crescent. Uh, you might recognize this image, which is not a science image. Uh, this is uh, an image by the team uh, which made Interstellar. Uh, except that this one is uh, a little bit more science than what they put into the movie. Um, this is uh, basically the same imaging as for uh, as, as at the top, but for a very thin disk of material falling into the black hole. And that's what it would look like if you were able to image it. Now the problem with observing black holes is that they are very small, and so having a telescope which is actually capable of resolving that kind of, of that kind of scale is extremely difficult. Awesome. Yes. What causes the asymmetry? It's because um, matter coming towards you uh, beams like towards you. So the size of the disk where the matter comes towards you beams like towards you, and so the, you, you receive more energy from that side of the disk. While the, the matter going the other way sends most of its light in the opposite direction, and so you don't see it that way. So that's one thing that was not in the movie. In the movie, it's symmetric, maybe because it's more pleasing to the eye, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But, but, uh, but actually, you, see, you would see most of the light coming from one side of the black hole. You see also those weird features below and above, which is, matter, which is from the matter behind the black hole, uh, and that's a relativistic effect that we can discuss in a minute. So yeah, general relativity. Uh, because black holes and neutron stars are objects in which general relativity has important effects, we have to at least uh, talk a little bit about what general relativity does uh, in practice if you want to understand the observations. Uh, Einstein developed general relativity as a way to solve uh, 
a problem, which is that um, he uh, assumed that the laws of physics should be the same for all observers regarding of, the, of their motion, whether you are moving left or the right, or close to the speed of light, or, uh, uh, or see my trace with respect to me, you should see the same laws of physics. And the speed of light in particular should be the same for everyone, and nothing should go faster than the speed of light. That's a problem for the standard way in which we think about gravity, Newton's theory of gravity. Because in Newton's theory of gravity, you think, I have an object here, I have an object here, and this object exerts a force on this object, and vice versa, this object exerts a force on this object. But that's instantaneous. The objects know immediately where the other object is, and so you have information traveling faster than the speed of light, and that's not allowed in Einstein's theory. And to actually solve that problem, he has to design an entirely new way to treat gravity. And that, that is to treat gravity as a curvature of space. That is, if you have a mass somewhere, it curves space, and instead of objects feeling forces from other masses, you have objects following the curvature of space created by other masses. So here is a curvature, for example, uh, visualized from a massive object, uh, which, which creates a curvature such, such that if you are coming towards an object, you are going to orbit around it. And frankly, it has nearly the same effect as Newton's theory for relatively low mass, well separated objects, but it has some interesting uh, consequences in terms of very massive objects and in terms of light as well, because in this theory, light itself can be bent by the curvature of space-time. So light, light itself feels gravity. So general relativity has had a large number of success in predictions. Uh, the first one, which was actually not a prediction of general relativity, but was a problem that was known and existed before general relativity was derived, is the period of chance of Mercury. What that is, is that astronomers look at the orbit of Mercury over time, and the orbit of Mercury is roughly a minute, but it's a minute where the closest point from the Sun slightly moves over time. That by itself is not a problem, because uh, if it was just Mercury and the Sun, Mercury would be in, in an ellipse around the Sun, but because there are other planets around perturbing the orbit of Mercury, that causes the orbit to slightly move over time. But the actual amplitude of that motion was too large to be explained by just the other planets. And when Einstein derived his theory of general relativity, it immediately predicted that uh, the extra advance of the orbit of Mercury that we were seeing were exactly what, general relativity, uh, what the general relativity theory was giving you. That was the first big success of general relativity, is that you could immediately solve that long-standing problem in astrophysics. Another success would be to actually measure the effect of gravity on light. Uh, you can see that if an object has behind another heavy object, because of the gravity of the object between you and the source, light is going to be bent. That means multiple things. That means first, that light takes longer to reach you, because the actual path that light takes is longer. And it also means that uh, light seems to come from a different direction, because it has bent around the other object, and now, even though the source is in that direction, you see it coming from there. And that has been, the, the time delay has been measured by sending, a, by sending a spacecraft behind the sun and looking at the tiny delay due to uh, the light bending around the sun. And the actual change in the direction of light has been met, observed in a much more dramatic fashion in what is called an Einstein ring, which is uh, shown here. This is a very massive cluster of galaxy between us and the source. And because this light from the source curves all the way around the galaxies from all directions, it appears to us as a ring of light instead of just a point. That's the prediction uh, of general relativity, and that has been observed in multiple systems now uh, with beautiful images optically from the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the main thing that I want to say about uh, general relativity, and now again uh, move a little bit into uh, actual neutron stars and black holes. Maybe the most useful uh, object in the study of neutron stars and black holes. Uh, are pulsars. Pulsars are amazing objects for astrophysics. But a pulsar is, is it's a neutron star which is rotating and so has a relatively strong magnetic field generally misaligned with respect to the rotation axis. So the pulsar is rapidly rotating and uh, the fact that its magnetic field is rotating around uh, uh, as well uh, slows down the pulsar extracting energy from the rotation 
rotation of the pulsar, and that energy is released into uh, a lot of electromagnetic emission from the pulsar. So it has first the effect of slowing down the rotation of the pulsar over time, also relatively slowly, and second, it means that you get beam of radiation which come from a direction which is misaligned with the axis of rotation of the pulsar, and so, yeah. It's a neutron star, so presumably it's neutral. Why does a neutral body rotate and create a magnetic field? So the magnetic field uh, can come from the origin of star that being frozen in it, or, uh, and, that, and uh, that's. I mean, you don't you don't need uh, charge. You, you, don't, you don't need the, the neutron star set to create a magnetic field. Right? I just tell you. Is it from the spins of the neutrons? Um. No, no, I, I think in, in, neutral, in the first star it can be explained by just contraction of the magnetic field that was initially in the, in the star, and then some, some, it is beginning to amplify, to amplify the, magnetic, the C magnetic field uh, from, the rotation, from the rotation of the star. Uh, you, you can exchange energy between the magnetic field and the uh, stellar rotation. Uh, you, you know, yeah, but also the neutral star does have some charged particles around. Uh, there, are, there are charged particles moving along the magnetic field lines. It's not entirely, it's not entirely, it's neutral in the, like most matter, uh, but it's not entirely neutrons. There are some protons and electrons that are still hanging around and that can actually uh, follow those magnetic field lines and uh, <coughs> actually they're, they're, they're mostly having in, in, in uh, avoiding any electric field remaining in the system. You can say that. Um, so the main, the main effect of uh, that beam of radiation for us is that well, if I, if I have a pulsar and I'm rotating and I have a beam of radiation horizontally, I'm going to each rotation period shine a beam of, of light at you. And it, so we will see a blip of radiation, uh, radio waves, every rotation period of the pulsar, very regular. So pulsars for us, their, their, main, uh, their main use is not necessarily studying neutron stars themselves, but they are also useful for that, it's as extremely accurate clocks. Some pulsars have rotation periods which are known to 13 significant digits. And we can predict the time at which each pulse will arrive, for some of them, for the best of them, within 100 nanosecond, one part in 10 to the 7 seconds. Uh, so that, that allows you to make very high precision astronomy. You, know, you, you can actually predict when the light should come to you, and so if the pulsar moves a little bit farther from you, let's say, the light should take a little bit longer to reach you. And if, if that light takes uh, just one microsecond longer to reach you, you would be able to tell. That's the first cell moving 300 meters. So you, you are able to, t to, t to say that the, uh, a small motion in the first cell, kiloparsecs away, can be detected just by saying, oh, the person arrived one microsecond too late this time. That's extremely uh, accurate astronomy. And that's Unlike anything else we can do usually in astronomy, where we say, oh, that galaxy is somewhere at 10 megaparsec plus or minus 5. Yeah. That's more the kind of accuracy we are used to. Uh, here we can say, oh, no, it, it moved by a kilometer. Uh, we cannot necessarily keep on exactly the distance at which it is, but the relative motion, at least, is fairly, is fairly easy to get. Um, and it's probably useful for the most rapidly rotating uh, pulsars, which are pulsars which rotate about a thousand times per second. Because then you, uh, the pulse comes so often that there's a, a small change in the phase of, 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 the, of the signal will allow you to get, uh, you will allow you to uh, tell that the pulse is out of phase because it should come be. Uh, so it's of a very bright, a very bright system. Uh, a, pulse, a pulsar is extracting ten thousand times as more uh, uh, power as the sun. Uh, even though it doesn't have any nuclear fusion or anything like that, it's all extracted from the rotation of the neutron star. So, how can we use those? One thing we can do is to get very good measurements of binary and triple systems, so the systems which you have two, star, two stars or three stars. Uh, in particular, it's one of the best ways to get accurate mass measurements uh, of systems. There is one particularly famous system that has been used recently. It's, which, is, which is like this, it's a pulsar in an orbit with another neutron star. And the beam of the pulsar is in the bay of the orbit, roughly. And the direction in which we are is also in the bay of the orbit. So we see the pulse coming in, and we see the binary edge up. What does that mean? That means that when the companion is in between us 
and the pulsar, you are going to get the, light, the radio wave emitted by the pulsar bending around the companion and arriving a little bit later. And when it's on the other side, it's going to arrive a little bit earlier. And using that, you can actually constrain very precisely the mass of the companion. And by looking at the uh, orbital period, then the mass of the pulsar itself as well. And that has allowed us to see that one neutral star T has a mass of near about two solar mass with 2% accuracy, which is much better than we can normally measure the mass of neutral stars. And it's very interesting because it's one of the two only neutral stars with that mass, the first of us observed, and the, more mass, the most massive neutral star that we have seen. And so, as the, more, as the maximum mass of the neutral star is an important constraint on nuclear physics, just being able to make that measurement has provided us constraint on whole neutrons interacting with each other. Uh, and we are very lucky with that system because it's, it's, a, it's a coincidence that the person is beaming at you in the same plane as the orbit, which is, itself is in the same plane as we are. We are very lucky with that system. And, we, and that on top of that, one of the neutral stars there happened to be very massive. So it's a very nice coincidence. But it's one extremely useful uh, use of, uh, of the pulsars. We can also use pulsars to test general relativity. I'm going to show you one example uh, later. We have detected planets around pulsar, planets as small as the moon, because the small change in the uh, motion of the pulsar due to a planet orbiting it, and the pulsar itself being influenced by the planets, can be detected as a change in the time of arrival of the pulsars. <coughs> and you can uh, use uh, pulsars to measure gravitational waves, which again uh, will come later. You can also get pretty nice images from pulsars. Uh, in particular, uh, those are pulsar wind nebula, which are hot regions created by the fact that pulsars on top of emitting a lot of radiation in, uh, in, in the beam also eject a lot of high aggressive particles, which eventually which, which heat the surrounding uh, medium and radiates, uh, in this case, in X-rays. So you have a, a few examples of what uh, those pulsar wind nebula can look like, and that allows us to constrain the environment of the pulsar hope the pulsars uh, eject particles and also uh, the motion of the pulsar. Because, for example, on the right side here, if the pulsar is moving relatively rapidly with respect to its environment, and uh, then the region in which particles are ejected is actually a conical shaft region, which, is, uh, which allows you to constrain the motion of the pulsar. Then there are other types of uh, highly magnetized neutral stars. This is a plot which shows basically uh, all of the pulsar and magnetars that are so far. Uh, the x-axis is the period of rotation, so very rapidly rotating pulsars are here. Those are the ones that we like to use for timing and high precision measurements. Uh, but you have pulsars which are, that are more like 10 seconds, which is super fast, but by pulsar standards, uh, relatively slow. And uh, the y-axis shows how fast the pulsar is slowing down, which is also which is related to a stronger magnetic field it has because it's the rotation of the magnetic field that slows down the pulsar. So you have, we have measured pulsars that are slowing down so fast that they have to have magnetic fields of order of 10 to the 14 Gauss. And typically magnetic field on the Earth is of order of 1 Gauss. So that's uh, 10,000 billion times the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a it's a point in which just how magnetic fields actually interact with matter uh, is not extremely well constrained. So we can, we can actually learn about extreme magnetic fields by studying those objects, which are called magnetars. Uh, and magnetars are very unstable objects which continuously, continuously rearrange themselves and send you bursts of radiation uh, as the magnetic field changes on the surface of the star. So that's probably the most, the most extreme type of pulsar. They are not as useful for timing because they are very unstable. They change all the time, so you can't make high precision astronomy with it, but they are very useful to uh, observe very high magnetic field environments. So, where are those uh, abbreviations AXP, SGR, CCO? Uh, it's all the uh, name that were originally given to the objects when we didn't know what they were. So, it, uh, SGI is a uh, sub gamma repeater, I think. Uh, AXP has to do with X ray. Uh, honestly, I don't. <laughs> I, but I might work with the more magnet art because that's what they are. But they, they, were, they were called for how you saw them at first. It's just, 
as a gamma ray repeater, for example, in the case of uh, SGR. And then after that, you can figure out, oh, actually, they are magnetars. And so now, as a, as a theorist, I call them magnetars because that's uh, what the theory tells me. And that's the name that uh, uh, an experimentalist would, would use because that's actually what they look like. But I don't know what each, what each of those uh, uh, acronyms means. Is there a theoretical limit on how strong magnetic fields can be? There is uh, there is quantum limits on uh, which uh, there is a limit at which quantum effects become important. Uh, I don't know if it actually sets a, a, a known maximum magnetic field, but I would think so. Uh, for for course not, yeah. I'm not hundred percent confident. Um, okay, and last type of neutral thought I want to mention is uh, X-ray binaries. X-ray binaries are a neutral star with a normal star next to it. And the normal star, uh, the, the very good neutral star is such that the, the, the normal star starts to send matter, send matter, potential matter to the neutral star. Uh, in an accretion disk, and that accretion disk can be very hot and radiates mostly in the X-rays. So you can actually observe the surrounding of the neutron star and its accretion disk in X-rays. More interestingly, at some point, the neutron star is very strongly heated by the material falling into it, and at some point the accretion might stop. And then you have a mostly isolated neutron star cooling down also largely in X-rays. And by observing how that neutron star cools down and what the radiation from its surface looks like, you can actually get constrained on what the size of the neutron star is. A bigger or smaller neutron star will radiate at different te uh, temperature. Um, and so people have used that to try to constrain the radius of the neutron star. And with current experiments, if you remember the type of errors that theory gave us, there's a fall of 20%, and current experiment gives us roughly the same kind of errors. So it does not really provide additional constraint on what the size of the neutron star is at this point. Also, there are better telescopes coming up in x rays which are uh, going to be able to, uh, to do a, a better job of constraining the radius. But it tells us that <coughs> currently there is reasonably good agreement uh, between uh, the experimental results and the theoretical results that the neutron size is somewhere between 8 and 15 kilometers, but probably more between 10 and 12. But we would like to do better, and that's where the next generation of experiments are going to come. Let's talk a little bit about black holes. Uh, black holes are naturally difficult to observe because there is nothing coming out of them. So the only thing that you can observe is the matter falling into the black hole. Uh, and another problem with black holes is that they are very small, so you usually, in most cases, don't have the spatial resolution with a telescope to actually see the inside of the black hole. All you can see is the global emission from the black hole and the uh, from the disk around the black hole, it is pretty much in its entirety. But even that can provide you useful information about the mass and the radiation of black holes. Uh, because how far, the, how close the disk can get to the black hole without matter just starting to fall into the black hole very rapidly depends on how massive the black hole is. Say a more massive black hole as an event horizon which is farther out and you won't get any radiation coming from inside the event horizon. And the closer the gas is to the black hole, the hotter it gets. So by looking at what the radiation from the entire disk, which is dominated by the small radius, is you can actually get an idea from the properties of the black hole. So that's one way in which people observe black hole and have been able to constrain black, uh, black holes in the galaxies with masses of order 5 to 15 times the mass of the sun. And I should say, well, yes, this has to be a black hole because matter is getting really, really close to it. It couldn't, it couldn't be a star or a neutral star, you know. Uh, and considering, uh, considering uh, the size that we, that we observe for the disk, it has to be in that range of mass. That's one way to do it. Another way which was first used uh, for the black hole at the center of our galaxy is to look at objects moving around the black hole. So the black hole itself is not easy to see. But if you have a star which is in orbit around a point where you see nothing, that tells you that there should be mass there. And at the center of our galaxy, there is a region where we see star moving around a mass which, according to the orbit, should be about should be a few 
million times the mass of the sun. If there was a few million suns there, we would see them. But we, we don't see that. Uh, no, we, no, we are able to actually see that there is a black hole there at the time, we couldn't. Uh, and so, that was a strong indication that yes, there must be a black hole there, because there, there, is, there are stars orbiting something that is a few million times the mass of the sun, and yet we don't see anything there. That's sort of a <coughs> proof by elimination, but as I mentioned, we can actually start to do better. There is an experiment which is called the Event Horizon Telescope, which observe black holes in millimeter wavelengths. Uh, and that's actually not one telescope, it's a network of telescopes spread all around the world. There are some in the South Pole, in Chile, in Hawaii, in the US. Uh, and all those telescopes together look at the black hole in the center of our galaxy and also at another black hole, a, a much more massive black hole in the galaxy M87. Uh, so it, uh, because that black hole is more massive, it is bigger, but it's also farther. So, overall, both of them are about the same size. And they are both the biggest black holes that we can hope to see in our neighborhood. Uh, and what we should see at those wavelengths, according to simulation, is something like the on the left, uh, in which you will see that bright material coming from the side of the black hole where material is coming towards you, and then you will see a shadow, which is the region where the black hole is. And the prediction is that this is of order of 13 of those telescopes working together, you can actually get a slightly blurrier image of the same thing and actually resolve for the first time the horizon of the black hole. And that experience is experiment taking data right now and it's very close to actually resolving the, the horizon. Um, and give you useful measurements of the, of the black hole. Of the black hole. Once you get its size, you can actually get Uh, no, this, this, is, uh, this is a prediction of what the experience should see. Ah. The, 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 the data from the, from, the, from the experience is being taken. You'll see this on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. On the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, is, and is this the prediction of what it will look like from M87 or from the Milky Way? Uh, this is for the Milky Way, uh, but uh, it's not very different. Uh, they, they, have, they have the same size in the sky, roughly. So, uh, the actual appearance should be uh, fairly similar. There, there's, there's a difference in how much gas is falling into each of those black holes, or how fast they are accreting, so there will be difference there in luminosity. But uh, I think at the, at the level of accuracy that the experiment can currently reach, it's got, they are going to look uh, very similar if the black holes have roughly the same properties. If one black hole is, is rotating very rapidly and the other is not rotating, then they will back to very different. But, but otherwise, they, they are probably going to have fairly similar outlook. Um, and uh, another um, way in which you can observe black holes is by looking at stars getting close to the black hole and being destroyed by the black hole. And here is a simulation of one of those events. The star gets close to the black hole, and because of the strong gravitational forces close to the black hole, it is entirely destroyed, part of the material is ejected away, and the rest of the accretion is around the black hole. What does that look like in practice? Well, if your black hole initially didn't have much matter around it, you don't see anything, because it's a black hole, it doesn't really uh, But then, suddenly, you have a lot of matter falling into the black hole, and, and a bright accretion is around it, so you would get a burst of radiation, and burst might mean here a few months, longer uh, event, but, uh, you will, you will get a, an event which, by the time scale at which the black hole evolves relatively short, in which you suddenly get more radiation, and then it falls down as all of the matter from the star falls into the black hole. This is a situation by uh, James Gershon. Um, and finally, the last topic that I want to touch on is uh, gravitational wave astrophysics. So, gravitational wave are strange predictions of uh, general relativity that if you have accelerating mass in general activity, they lose energy from the emission of gravitational waves, which are effectively waves in the curvature of space time, which I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. And the strongest emitter of gravitational waves are objects which are very compact and very, moving very rapidly close together. And that tells us that there are going to be black holes and neutron stars in very close orbit. Because black holes and neutron stars being so small, can orbit each other at like 50 kilometers away, you can have two solar mass objects orbiting each other. And that is the uh, type of system in which 
collision resolution would be the strongest because you have very rapidly moving objects, very close, uh, with very strong gravitational fields. What it also means is that if I have two black holes or two neutron stars orbiting each other relatively close by and losing energy by sending gravitational waves, they are going to get closer and closer together as they lose energy and they are eventually going to merge. That will give you a very extreme event in which two objects more massive than the Sun suddenly get together and merge within a few milliseconds. In a few milliseconds they will go from being widely separated objects, from being, from being separated objects, well defined separated objects, into one black hole or one very big neutron star. That has to be a, a, such a strong rearrangement of matter in such a short time scale that has to give you an extremely bright event. So how do you generate gravitational waves? Well, typically just moving masses. So moving masses drive with their, their curvature, and curvature propagates through space at the speed of light. And then as your two massive objects in the binary orbit each other at the center of this uh, uh, video, the curvature, they, the curvature they drive with them generate gravitational waves, which are, uh, which are sent away from the binary and carry energy. As they carry energy with the binary, the binary gets closer and closer together. And uh, the, the black holes are going to get so close that they are eventually going to merge. As they get closer and closer together, the amplitude of the gravitational waves also increase. You get a better chance to actually detect them when they are close, very close to merge. So, you see, you know, they are extremely close to merge. Uh, they, they also change their uh, orbital plane over time due to uh, general physical effects. So that's why you see the, the plane moving in time. And over here they are actually merging. You see a much stronger emission of gravitational wave which peaks right at the time where the two black holes get together and then not merge anymore at all. Whoa. How often does that happen? How often does that happen? Uh, not very often in a single galaxy. Uh, the, the, most com the more common is probably not two black holes, but rather two neutron stars. And it's roughly, uh, we don't know, there are, there are some of these are 5 to 100 in the, in the rate. Uh, but uh, roughly once every 10,000 years in a galaxy like the Milky Way. That means that you have to have a large number of galaxies that you can observe if you want to see those events. Why did the plane of the emission shift? That has to do with, uh, so it, the, two, the two black holes in that, uh, movie were both rotating and they were rotating along different axes and the interaction between the spins of the black holes and also the rotation and the orbital motion actually causes both the spin to change orientation and the orbital plane to change. So there's an exchange of angular momentum between the black holes, the binary and the other black holes, which causes those planes to change uh, orientation. So the, the radiation emitted would be in the form of gamma rays and Visible line. No, it's just gravitational waves, which is a completely different type of uh, uh, event of uh, radiation. Uh, okay, maybe I should start with that. Okay, what's, what do they look like? Let's start with that. What, so if a gravitational wave passed through us, what does it look like? Well, it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not photons coming. It's, it's not like electromagnetic waves at all. What would happen is that if a gravitational wave comes from the sky and passes through the Earth, through this room, well, first, the distance between me and the, op the opposite wall will seem to increase, while the distance between the two opposite walls here will start to decrease, and then, the, and then it will oscillate back to the, uh, the other way and keep going that way. So there will be oscillations of the distance of, uh, measured between different regions. That's, it, it's, it's, it's effectively uh, an, an oscillation of space itself. Uh, and so it, is, it, has, it has not much not, not, nothing to do at all with uh, normal gamma or radio or radiation. It's a completely different beast, which is predicted by general relativity. Aren't there any uh, electromagnetic uh, emissions uh, from a black hole merger? Um, from the black hole merger, um, it is, there is possibly weak electromagnetic uh, emission, but not at the level as if you would be able to see them. That, that, uh, you would need to have, a, and that's if you have an accretion disk around the binary, because the black hole themselves don't, don't radiate. Um, but if you have two neutron stars, on the other hand, or a neutron star in the black hole, then you can get very strong uh, radiation uh, after the merger. Well, because the new, uh, I'm going to show you a movie at the end of the talk and come back to that. Uh, this is, so, 
The previous one was the generation of the gravitational wave. This is what it would look like if we had a telescope good enough to resolve the two black holes merging, which we don't. But this is what it would, what it would look like. Uh, the two black holes orbit each other, and the distortion of space-time changes the way we see light sources behind them, and then the black holes are going uh, to eventually merge. This is a uh, movie made by like, Brad Cornell, Brad Stone, uh, Andy Bowen, and uh, other Brad students at Cornell. Now this might seem like a relatively crazy idea, all those gravitational waves and, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and space moving around. Uh, so it would be good to have at least, before we try to detect them and build expansive detectors to detect them, it would be, it would be good to have an idea that, yes, this effect really exists. And it has actually been observed. It has been observed by a data. It has been observed using, once more, pulsars. What does it have uh, done is that they have measured a binary pulsar, and as the binary evolves, they, uh, they saw the change in the orbital properties of the, of the binary because the time of arrival of the pulse from the pulsars was changing, in the same way uh, that we've seen before for measuring the mass of the, the neutron star. Uh, and what they've seen is that the evolution of the time of the orbital properties of the pulsar was exactly what general relativity predicted if the system was losing energy through the emission of gravitational waves. This is uh, what is shown here, is the evolution of uh, actually the, uh, the location of the pulsar when they are close, uh, closest together as a function of time, and uh, the black curves and prediction from general relativity, and uh, I'll still on some data around here uh, early on, before getting another prize for, for this, and so oh yeah, it's very good to this general relativity. And now we've kept taking data on that system for a long time, and it has remained in exact agreement with general relativity ever since. And it tells us, yes, uh, indeed, those systems do lose energy in the predicted manner, presumably through the emission of gravitational waves. So now, how do you actually detect them? Because we haven't managed to do that yet. Well, we have to go back to what it, look, what it looks like, the gravitational wave passing by. So the gravitational wave passing by means the distance in two perpendicular directions that's going to change with opposite signs. So the way that you detect them, one way to detect them on Earth, is with the LIGO detector for, or, uh, in the US, or the Virgo detector in Italy, and there's a Kagura detector in Japan which is going to be built, a network of detector which all look basically the same. It is two perpendicular arms, in the case of LIGO each of them is three kilometers long, and in each of those arms you shoot very powerful lasers. And you use those lasers to measure changes in the distance, changing the length of the arms as gravitational wave pass by. And if you want to measure a gravitational wave from merging black holes, you have to be able to measure changes in those distances to about the width of a proton. And they have actually proven that they can do that kind of noise prediction in their system, in the first generation of the detector, which is an amazing engineering uh, feat. Uh, and now the detector is being upgraded, uh, has been upgraded to more powerful lasers and be be better uh, sensitivity, and uh, it's going to start taking uh, data for the first time in the, this fall, and should actually reach the kind of sensitivity at which it should, should see those gravitational waves within three or four years. But this should be a really exciting moment for gravitational waves, that we expect that within three or four years, we should be able to actually detect them for the first time. And because it's an entirely new way to observe the universe around us, uh, any, uh, it's a way to observe basically any moving, any accelerating mass, as long as they are moving fast enough. Uh, it will allow us to study completely different uh, systems than normal electromagnetic waves or even uh, neutrinos that they started using there also to uh, study the universe. There are other very useful ways to uh, observe gravitational waves. One of them, not surprisingly, is once more to use pulsars, because pulsars are awesome. Uh, you, in this case, you are, the, the arm of your detector is the, is the distance between us and, uh, and a pulsar. Or multiple pulsars, and you have pulsars all across the galaxy, and you use the entire galaxy as your detector. And if your pulsar there is moving in slightly differently from your pulsar there, or rather all of your pulsars in that direction are moving differently and in the same way as all the pulsars in that direction, you can say, well, there is a gravitational wave passing through the galaxy and actually causing the pulsars in one direction to move in one way and the pulsar in the other direction to move in the other way. And in that way, the so the, the LIGO detector uh, allows you to observe black holes of, of a few times the mass of the sun. 
Um, basically because if you try to go to low frequency uh, on the Earth, it just doesn't work. You get seismic noise, you get all kinds of, all kinds of uh, uh, positions that you cannot hope to produce in your detector. But if you are, if you are using pulsars, they are not very sensitive to seismic noise. You can go, you can go to very low frequency uh, oscillations, and you can actually measure the merger of very massive black holes, which you call most slowly. And the pulsar time generation is sensitive to uh, black holes of a few billion times the mass of the Sun. And they don't merge very often, and we don't think that uh, the pulsar time generator is, uh, is likely to see a single source, uh, although we could be lucky. Most likely, it will be able to see a background of multiple sources emitting gravitational waves all together and tell us how often very massive black holes merge. That, all that is important because it also gives us an idea of how often very massive galaxies in which those black holes uh, live merge. And that should happen within the next 5 to 10 years, probably. It's, it, it depends on how well those persons are timed and how, what the actual event rate is. And finally, there is a Experiment which has been uh, discussed for a long time and uh, has been continuously delayed, which is the VISA experiment. That is uh, also a space based detector. The principle is the same you send three satellites on orbit behind the Earth, and with distance between them, a significant fraction of the orbit of the Earth, uh, of the distance between the Earth and uh, the Sun. And so you should place the three satellites. And you measure the changes in the distance uh, between the between the satellites, and that allows you. I mean, it's a smaller detector than the pulsar I mean, but it's much bigger than the one uh, on the ground, and uh, it allows you to measure uh, black holes of order of a few million times mass of the sun. Yes. What is the speed of gravitational waves? The speed of light. So, in this pulsar time array, how do you compensate for the different arrival times of the light? Um, sorry. So, in your pulsar time array, you know where your pulsars are, you know where you are. So you, you can predict, if a gravitational wave passes through the galaxy in a, from a certain direction, you can predict how each of the objects should move with respect to the others. And, and that, that allows you to say how much of a change in the, time of a, in the distance between the pulsar and us should be. Uh, but it has to be done in a statistical sense because you, you don't exactly know the location of the pulsar. And so, in, in, but you will only believe it if you say, oh, all the pulsars in that direction have a global motion. And all the pulsars in that direction have a global motion in, the, in another direction. And, 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 you, and you average over, 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 over all the pulsars in the sky, and, actually, and, and then you, you actually get a more statistically significant uh, measurement. How do you know they move? Sorry? How do you know they move? Uh, so, you know they move because the pulse that arrives to you, oh, arrives a little bit earlier, a little bit later. Oh, the side counts. No, 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 no. So that, 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 that's, why, and that, that's why they are so extremely useful, because you can pinpoint their change of location with such really high accuracy. So, yeah, so the, the laser detector, which is for million mass black holes, uh, is currently planned to be launched by the European Space Agency, uh, I think in the 2030s, 2034 maybe, uh, but it has been uh, changed so often that the uh, I'm not sure I actually believe that they that much. Uh, and it's not quite clear what form it will take either because that depends on whether the US gets back, get back on board or not, uh, which might depend on whether we detect radiation wave before then or not. So that's, a, that, that's more uncertain. So it would be a very useful experience, experiment because you can both detect millions of mass black holes, which are most of the massive black holes in the, uh, in the, in the galaxies, and also you can measure uh, the mergers of white dwarfs which are more widely separated than neutron star, and so uh, generally more slower. Uh, so white ones in the galaxies can be observed with, uh, with the visual data. So what we can do with gravitational waves, well first we can prove that they exist, and then we can actually start measuring all those binaries merging and <coughs> constrain the rate at which that happens, and that actually gives you a constraint on supernova rates, on supernova occurs, on which star gives you neutron star, which star gives you black holes. You can test Predictions from general relativity, you can see that the signal is what it is predicted to be in general relativity. And if you use them to constrain the size of neutron star, because the gravitational wave that you receive from neutron star mergers does depend on the size of the neutron star, then you can constrain nuclear physics again, in the same way as we have seen before. 
just getting the rings of the neutral star, or getting the mass of the neutral star is very massive. We don't need to get constraints on nuclear physics. And finally, you can get, uh, you can understand gamma ray bursts, which are very sh short gamma ray bursts, which are very uh, short bursts, less than a second uh, of extremely bright gamma rays that we observe regularly, but whose origin is not fully understood, and possibly the production of heavy elements. And that is because of mergers involving neutral stars, which I'm going to show you here. This is what happens when a black hole and a neutral star merge. The black hole, the neutral star is blue here, and again it gets closer and closer to the black hole as the radiation is diluted. And then the tidal field of the, the gravitational field of the black hole causes the neutral star to be destroyed, some matter is ejected, and some form of very massive accretion disk around the black hole. And so you know you have a very rapidly accreting black hole with a very compact system. And we think that that is the kind of system that can power a short gamma ray burst. But this has to be proven by actually connecting a gravitational wave event with an actual gamma ray burst. Uh, we also think that the matter which is ejected, which is very neutron rich, it's 95% it's neutrons, can, uh, uh, will recombine and go to lo uh, lower density and form heavy elements. And those heavy elements uh, could, ex could, be, it could be the main source of many of the heavy elements, such as uh, uranium and gold, that we see in the galaxy around us, that we see on Earth, but whose origin is not quite clear. It could be in those mergers, or it could be uh, also in supernova explosions. We don't really know. If those mergers occur often, often enough, it's probably the mergers because they are guaranteed to give you heavy elements. But if they don't occur often enough, then we have to find a way to make it happen in supernova. And we don't really know. There are arguments on why it could happen, but current simulations of supernova explosions actually don't form those heavy elements. So we don't really understand uh, for sure whether, whether uh, you could generate all those heavy elements such as gold and uranium in supernova. But we know to form them in neutron star mergers, we just don't know if it happens often enough to explain everything. So I'm going to uh, stop here. Uh, I show you the extreme objects that us to better understand uh, physics, nuclear physics, gravitation, uh, and also astrophysics, such as supernovae and uh, high energy events that we observe uh, regularly. Um, and there are multiple uh, exciting experiments that I expect to come in the next few years in this topic. Measurement of the, the actual horizon of a black hole, measurement of the radii of neutral star, detection of gravitational waves, which I hope will be uh, us entertain uh, that topic in the next five, ten years. <laughs> Thank you. So come back next month to Bob Ken Shan about whether he can create these heavy elements in supernovae, but in the meantime, uh, any, oh, yeah. oh, that's the well, right. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. yeah, two different kinds of supernovae, yeah. um, but uh, Ken, I'm sure Ken will kind of cover that yeah. some of that next month. Using the same data set and finding 
answer that are three or four kilometers apart from each other by making different interpretations of, of what happens across the region star. And that is also starting to converge towards a single interpretation, but it has taken time. And, uh, uh, I think there might be something that we just don't understand about how the system works. It's a very it's a complex emission, uh, which is very difficult to analyze. Uh, and that's also why I think mean, other, so other sources of measurement for neutron star radar and masses would be very useful because they would come with different sources of errors and you would actually get a better handle on what they actually are in real life. Is the size of a black hole proportional to its mass? Uh, yes, that's the there's also a dependency in rotation speed. But, uh, but, it's, but at fixed uh, spin, at fixed rotation speed of the black hole is proportional to its mass, yes. Um, what keeps a black hole, a neutron star, from What would 
happen in a uh, straight to black hole. That depends a lot on the black hole. Uh, if you have a very big black hole, like the one at the center of our galaxy, which is a million times mass of the sun, as you cross the event horizon, you wouldn't notice much, because the gravity there is not actually that strong. You, would, you, 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 you might be able to live your entire life before reaching the, the, the center of the black hole, where gravity is really strong, and you start running into problems. Uh, if you have a small black hole, like uh, the one merging with neutron stars, uh, then as you get close to the black hole, the, the gravitational forces from the black hole, so the, the, the gravity, will cause you to be stretched in one direction and compressed in the other direction. So you are, you, you are going to be torn apart uh, by, by the black hole, or the Earth will be torn apart by the black hole in this case. Uh, so it, it, depends, it depends a lot on the type of black hole that you are considering. And, uh, how long you want to live once you get into the black hole, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the nearest black holes are probably far away enough that we don't have to worry. Yeah, about. yeah, that's, yeah, that's not really an issue. <laughs> um, I think in your, your previous slide there, you had one um, terminate you were ignoring. I think there were neutrinos that were um, created when the neutron started to create it. Would those be detectable? Would they be like a burgeon of neutrinos? Uh, you, you, now, you would need the merger to occur basically within our galaxy for the neutrinos to be detectable. Uh, so, considering the rate of mergers, that's very unlikely. Um, uh, there, there, are, it's, it's, there are a lot of neutrinos being emitted, but neutrinos interact so weakly right. that... I mean, uh, they, they would reach us, they would just pass... The few that would, would reach the Earth would just pass through us. And, uh, would they be detectable like an ice cube or something? Uh, uh, not, not for the mergers that light will receive. Uh, so you, 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 would need, you would need a very rare event right next to us, but by right next to us, I mean within our galaxy, uh, to actually be able to see them. And how long do those bursts last? Do you have any idea how long those... Uh, which bursts? The, the neutrinos from uh, like a, when you create a neutron star. So the typical time scale for the evolution in the disk due to neutrinos is about 10 milliseconds. So a few tens of milliseconds. Oh yeah, it's, it's a very rapid evolution. The, the entire movie I showed was probably five milliseconds, ten milliseconds. That's, yeah, be, 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 because the, the objects that are very close together, very compact, and it's, uh, moving at nearly through the night, it, it all happens extremely rapidly. The, the gravitational waves signal detected by LIGO in the case of two neutron stars, they will see the system in the LIGO frequency band for about 30 minutes. But most of that is just the object going very far, relatively far apart, and just slowly getting closer together. The actual merger is like a couple of minutes. Okay. Are the neutrinos released whenever a proton and an electron combine? Yes. Are, are neutrinos released at other times? Uh, they can be released when the inverse reaction occurs. Uh, so uh, you can uh, get uh, anti-neutrinos then. Uh, you can also get uh, neutrinos by making an electron and a positron into a neutrino and anti-neutrino. Uh, you can get uh, you can get neutrino anti-neutrino pairs emitted by basically any uh, object that has enough energy for that pair to be created uh, and 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 use that energy to, to that pair. So we got, there are, there are many, but the, the, main, the main source of neutrinos is protons and neutrons. Uh, the protons being transformed into neutrons and neutrons being transformed into protons. So, so, thing, so a huge amount of neutrinos released when a neutron star is formed. Mm. Very little oh yes, yes. So the, and that's very important for the supernova process. And so I didn't mention that because I, I wasn't going to talk about supernova in details. But so you, you have that matter which is shot and blown, blown away by this by the original formation of the neutron star. But then, if you don't include neutrinos, so the, the shock goes through all the material surrounding the, the, the forming neutron star, it slows down as it runs into all that material, and eventually just stops. And what actually allows the shock to keep going on is all the neutrinos produced at the core of the neutron star are reabsorbed in the hot regions in the shock and re-energize the shock. That's one of the ways which we re-energize the shock. They are, they are, it's a combination of effects, but that's one of the important effects. is neutrinos from the neutron star re-energizing the shock. And actually uh, allowing the supernova to explode. Without neutrinos, neutrinos simulations of uh, supernova just don't find explosion. You, 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 
you have a shock that goes off, and then it stops, and everything pulls back on, and you get the back one. So there's a significant uh, time when neutrinos do interact with matter. Say, yeah, you just need, you need uh, either a really large amount of neutrinos or very high density material. I mean, remember that the, the, the density in the system is huge. Right. Uh, so uh, neutrinos in the core of a neutron star are actually trapped there. They, they interact so often that they are in equilibrium with matter. Uh, neutrinos on Earth just pass through us all the time and we not notice. Uh, on that subject, then, the heavy elements like uranium and gold are formed then from neutrons due to the fact that the neutron is and a neutrino uh, form a proton electron. Is that correct? Uh, the, the neutrino do influence the formation of the heavy elements, but the most important thing is that you have, so you eject a few percent of a solar mass of material, which is mostly neutrons. So you have material which is like 90, 95% of neutrons, and when they recombine into heavy elements, it's going to be elements that are extremely neutron rich. And the, the decay part of those elements is towards uh, fairly massive elements such as uh, um, uranium and gold. Uh, now, where the neutrinos come into effect is that uh, because that material is ejected from the merger, and the merger itself produces a lot of neutrinos, the neutrinos are going to shine onto the ejected material. And change the ratio of neutrons and protons, and change what the result of the nucleosynthesis is. Okay. Uh, but fundamentally, it's just it's mostly the fact that you are ejecting material which is mostly neutrons, as, a, as, as opposed to a supernova explosion where you eject material which is normal atomic matter, roughly the same amount of neutrons and protons. Okay. Let's thank Francois again.